Good morning. Well, I just want to start by thanking you all for uh, just the opportunity to preach the word to you this morning. Uh, Pastor Keith asked me if I could take this second Sunday of his sabbatical, and I love to bring the word to, to the Lord's people, so I jumped at the chance, so I pray that it is as much of a blessing to you as it is to me this morning. Um, so we are going to look at the second chapter of Revelation, uh, the first seven verses. So I wanted to read those seven verses and then pray, and then we will move forward. So John writes in Revelation chapter 2, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful to you for the word that you have given us. We're grateful for you and covering your children in your forgiveness and your grace, allowing us to gather together and to sing praises to you, allowing us to look to your word and through the work of the Spirit be able to understand it. Lord, I pray as your servant that you would speak clearly through my stammering tongue. Lord, allow me to proclaim your gospel to your people. May you be glorified in this. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Revelation. Revelation is a book that, over my ministry, in various contexts, working with college kids, working with our youth here, I have been asked to teach on, and up until just some few months ago, uh, I had avoided teaching on it, because it is a hefty book. It's a book with a lot of mystique surrounding it, Um, but I have been teaching the youth Sunday school class here for a few months now, and again, some weeks ago, we were finishing up the book of Acts. And I asked these teens what book of the Bible they wanted to study through next. And pretty emphatically, they asked me to go through the book of Revelation together. I later learned from other teachers that this is a book that has come up often as a request with this particular group of students. Each week that we have been walking through this book, I have been challenged And we're not even out of the second chapter of Revelation yet. And so when Pastor Keith asked me to preach on this second Sunday of his sabbatical, I almost instantly knew that the Lord was leading me to preach from one of these early passages of Revelation. Because they, again, have each challenged me in my own walk with Christ. And I knew that he could use these words to do the same for you. So here we are, Revelation chapter 2. Now, since we are parachuting down into this text in the second chapter of Revelation, I want to first provide you with some information that will help to give the lay of the land. What is happening in Revelation 2? To know what's happening in Revelation 2, 
we have to first look at Revelation 1. In the first chapter of Revelation, we are told that this book is a series of messages that God is giving to the Apostle John. These messages are a revealing or a revelation of his plans, God's plans for his church and its future. And this is why I am sure when you think of Revelation, you immediately think of all the end time prophecy stuff. All that is in this book, but we're not at that point yet. At this point, the Apostle John has been exiled to the island called Patmos because he was a follower of Jesus Christ that simply wouldn't keep his mouth shut. The Roman government at this point in history was not keen on the Christians, and so the aged apostle was exiled on this island. And it is on this island that John received the series of visions that make up the book of Revelation. In this first chapter of Revelation, we are treated with a description of the risen and the reigning King Jesus that John sees in his first vision. And I want to just read you some of the words of Revelation chapter 1. We won't camp out here long, but as a Christian, you need to understand the majesty of our King in this vision. The Apostle John writes in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 20, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and then in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Church, John has seen Christ. John walked with Jesus Christ on earth. John has watched and heard Jesus Christ teach. He has watched as Christ was beaten And then crucified. We're told in the Gospels that John even stood by the mother of Jesus throughout the time that his beloved teacher was dying. John saw Christ after his resurrection. But this, this vision that he records in Revelation chapter 1, this is different. Because this vision shows Jesus in his majesty. No longer is Jesus humbled by the flesh of man. But he is radiant in his majesty and in his glory. He is the reigning king. 
And what is John's reaction? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John is petrified with fear and awe of his reigning Lord. This was the man whom John walked with for years of his life. Whom he had conversations with. Loving, deep conversations. But now, his Lord is reigning majestically over all of creation. His Lord is victorious over sin and death those enemies that Christ now holds the keys to. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But the ever-loving Lord Jesus laid his hand on his servant's shoulder and gave him that sweet assurance. Fear not, it is me, your king, And I have work for you, John. Jesus then directs us to seven lampstands, representing seven distinct and real churches in Asia at the time of this revelation. And seven stars in his hand, which are the seven angels that have been tasked to watch over these seven churches. This is an important detail, as it is through these angels that John will deliver messages to these churches. Here at the beginning of the Revelation, Jesus is simply giving messages to John to give to these seven real churches at this point in history. These seven churches are those listed by Jesus in the passage that we have just read. And each of the messages, well, they follow a pretty consistent breakdown as you read through them. Jesus first begins each message by commending the church in the city for something. You have done this well. In our outline today, we will call this the good. Then Jesus follows that good with a problem that he has with that particular church, the bad. Third, Jesus gives, us, gives the Christians a warning followed by a promise. The good, the bad, the warning, and the promise. These warnings and promises certainly applied to the churches that they were first given. But as the second audience, the church of Jesus Christ today, we can and we must learn from these words of Jesus, for they reveal much of Jesus' hope for his bride. So today we will look at the first of these messages, the message to the church of Ephesus. Verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This first verse, again, is telling us that this letter is being given to the church at Ephesus, the community of Christians in the city of Ephesus. Of Ephesus, and it is being given by Jesus Himself. We know that Jesus is the source of this letter because the description from chapter one Jesus is the one who holds the seven stars in His hand, and He is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So, this is a message to the church in Ephesus given by King Jesus through His servant John. And we are all made audience to it. Now, if you've spent any time reading your New Testament, you will surely recognize the name of this city. This is the same community of believers that the Apostle Paul wrote his own letter to, giving us the book of Ephesians in our New Testament. At this point in history that this revelation was given, the city of Ephesus was an important, a thriving city with a population that boasted around 300,000 people. The size and, and importance of the city was attributed to Ephesus being a major coastal port that would be used as an entry point into Asia. Ephesus was also the home to the great temple 
to the Roman pagan goddess Artemis. So this perfect storm of constant influx of people from all over the world and then a hot spot for pagan idol worship led to Ephesus being a place of moral debauchery and sin. To be a Christian in the city of Ephesus was a struggle. The Christians faced oppression from the pagan idol worshipers. One such act of oppression was the riot recorded in the book of Acts chapter 19 that saw the silver idol maker Demetrius as he stirred up the people against Paul and the Christians because he was losing business. Simply in the book of Acts, uh, we see that people were converting to Christianity because of Paul's mission work. And so these silversmiths who had the business of making idols, well, they obviously were losing business because Christianity does not need idols made by the hands of man. This obviously angered those pagans, and so they caused a riot against the Christians. Again, this was an early manifestation of the oppression of, against the Christians in Ephesus. But that oppression, oppression continued up through the time that John received this revelation. But oppression was but one of two fronts that the Christians in Ephesus were embattled against. The other was against false teachings. False teachings that were trying to break break into the ranks of the church. We see clearly how those ancient brothers and sisters of ours fared against these false teachers, these false apostles, when we look to Jesus' words in verses 2 and 3 of our passage. Jesus says to the Christians at Ephesus, I know your works, your toils, and your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. This is the good, the commendation from Jesus to the Christians at Ephesus. The Christians in Ephesus have endured oppression and are able to recognize and reject false teachings. Through the words of Jesus, we can understand that these Christians in Ephesus seemed to be well trained in the teachings of Christ and the apostles. And they served as protectors of truth. I like the word that one commentary used. The Ephesian Christians were gatekeepers of sound teaching. These believers worked hard and with patient endurance, defending the young, budding church against false doctrines in a time when bad religion was rampant. Jesus provides us with a clear example of this work of doctrinal defense Just three verses down in verse 6 of our passage, when he says to the Ephesians, Yet you have this, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now there's not a lot that we know of this group called the Nicolaitans. But using some context and some historic understanding, the picture of who these people are can become a tad clearer. This is the same group of people that are mentioned in Jesus' message to the church at Pergamum, just a few verses later in this same chapter of Revelation. In the city of Pergamum, these Nicolaitans, we are told, were successful in leading Christians in Pergamum down the road of syncretistic religion, meaning that these Christians in Pergamum embraced the teachings of the Nicolaitans, Mixing idol worship with Christianity. The Christians in Pergamon were guilty of practicing sexual immorality and idol worship, which are both traits that the early church father Arrhenius attributed to this heretical group, the Nicolaitans. 
So what we know is that the Nicolaitans were a heretical group that promoted a carnal lifestyle, and they tried to infiltrate the church in Ephesus, only to be rejected because these believers took their doctrine seriously. The Ephesian Christians recognized and dispelled false teachers that claimed to be apostles. And the only way that they would have been able to recognize false teachings is if they knew true teaching well. The main point and really the only point of our sermon today is this. We must know the word and we must love the Lord. We must know the word and we must love the Lord. You can see that this main point is made up of two distinct yet important pieces. First, know the word. We can understand that the Ephesians certainly did know the teachings of Christ and the apostles. The church in Ephesus was established by the work of the apostle Paul himself. And this city served as a sort of base of operations for the Apostle John for much of his ministry after Christ's resurrection. They knew the teachings of the church. They knew the words so well that they were able to recognize teachings that were off. Teachings that were disguised as as truth, but were proved to be false imitations of the genuine standard. And because these Ephesians knew the word, they are here being commended for it by Christ himself in our passage this morning. Brothers and sisters, this must be our goal. There are still false teachers out in our world today. There are false teachers in our country today that claim the name of Christianity, yet are teaching doctrines that do not align with Scripture. We as the church must not stand idly by and allow the truth of our Lord to be mangled. We must not allow the enemy to harm the bride of Christ by causing her to doubt the word of God in any area. This was, after all, that first strategy of attack by the enemy Satan against humanity. In that Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve walked with God, they had one rule from God, the first law. Do not eat of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the serpent Satan entered in and, and introduced that first question of doubt. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? With that first question, Doubt of God's command entered Eve's mind. And when doubt is allowed entry, it can serve as a corrosive force, eating away at the faith one has in the word of God. This is a strategy that the enemy still uses today. Look around at the churches that allowed themselves to ask the question, did God really say? Our society is filled with churches that have long proven to not be churches of the God of the Bible, accepting and believing doctrines that are contrary to the Bible. Believers are fleeing those places, and the result is cities that are home to nice coffee shops or apartments that house themselves in the shells of what used to be churches. And it leaves a culture that has lost its mind in regards to all things truth. Church, we must know the word of God. We must spend our time mining its riches and knowing its teachings. We must become so familiar with the word of God that we can recognize teachings that don't work with it. And we must be bold enough to call out false teachings and to defend the doctrines of our Lord and protect his bride from the lies of the enemy. We must be students of the word of God for life. But dear brother and sister, we must not detach the first part of this main point from the second. 
Yes, we must know the word. Yes and amen. But we must also love the Lord. Know the word and love the Lord. Look back at the text at verse 4. We see that Jesus, through John, immediately follows his commendation for the Ephesians up with a condemnation. Commendation followed by condemnation. Right on the heels of the good is the bad. You have done well in recognizing and rejecting false teachers. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. The bad, the Christians at Ephesus have abandoned their first love. These Christians have reached a point where they are able to recognize false teachings. This is good. We will all say that. This implies that they have studied and grown in an understanding of Christian doctrine. Yet, from the mouth of Christ himself, we are told that they have abandoned their first love. And the first love for the Christian is Christ himself. As unsaved sinners before Christ, our love is for ourselves. We are, we are our own idols. And that is the way that the world trains us, is it not? Look out for number one, the world will say. Love yourself. Care first for yourself and then for others. But when God breaks our heart of stone and makes it into a heart of flesh, When he brings us from death to life, our love is refocused off of ourselves and on to Christ. He becomes our first love. And the Ephesians have abandoned that first love. In the context of Christ's words, we should understand that they have done so in the pursuit of wisdom to defend his doctrines. And this can sound strange. That out of love for Christ, a Christian studies theology so much that he detaches the theology from the God that he is defending. But unfortunately, this is still so common in the church today. I tell you, I have spent much time on a seminary campus. And I have spent far too much time on social media in, quote, Christian circles. I will confess that I've been guilty of this at times in my own life. It is not hard. In fact, it is incredibly easy to get so wrapped up in knowing doctrine and studying theology for the sake of defending it and holding up a pure confession that one steps off of the foundation of the love of Christ. We become bigger heads at the expense of our heart for Christ. Christians, let us not fall into the mess that the Ephesians did. Let us remember our first love. If your heart has grown cold to Christ, remember the gospel. Remember what Christ has done for you. While you were still a sinner, the sovereign, good, and holy God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Jesus Christ, holy, sinless, died a criminal's death, died your death. And in dying on that brutal cross, he took your wicked sin upon himself in exchange for his perfectly clean, sinless record. Christian, God now attributes the death of Christ as the punishment for your sin. You are clear, but you're not only cleared of your debt, God sees the perfection of Christ as your perfection. He has made you holy. Christ died, for your, Christ died your death, and he defeated death itself in his resurrection. Now death can no longer, death will no longer hold any who call Christ king and bow to him in repentance. Since those who have bowed to Christ have been transformed from death to life, we are now able to love him and love him we must, church. 
We must never detach our pursuit of understanding from our love of Christ. The warning that Christ has given to the church at Ephesus is a dire one. Verse 5, Christ says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Christ's warning that he will remove the lampstand from the church at Ephesus is a warning that he will take their light away. He will take their identity as a gospel community away. He will extinguish their flame and scatter the ashes from existence. The church that abandons her love for Christ will not remain a church for long. Its witness in the world will be removed. How would this happen? How could a church's witness be removed? Well, there's a process here that is really consistent with what we're able to recognize in our own culture today. When we abandon our love for Christ, well, we become apathetic to his will, apathetic, uncaring to his way of life. When we become uncaring, apathetic to the will of Christ, we become uncaring about what Christ has to say. And when we become so relaxed on his teachings and on his commands, when we become relaxed on the word, when a church becomes relaxed in the word of God, then that church begins to accept teachings that are contrary to the word of God. This is precisely The process that we saw earlier when a church is not studied in the word. This is a cyclical process that, and the two sides of our main point must work together to fight it off. When we abandon our first love, our love for Christ, then we eventually do abandon any of his teachings that are contrary to how we feel or what we desire. And eventually the church is no longer worshiping the God of the Bible And the witness of the church does not honor him and the community of the world around. So church, we must both know the word and love the Lord and hold those together. The Christian that abandons his love for Christ in pursuit of wisdom for argument's sake is at risk of proving to have never truly loved Christ at all. We can remember the parable of those plants that sprouted quickly when the seed was sown, yet never rooted deep enough only to fall away when the heat came. Christians, we must have a wisdom of Christ, a wisdom of Christ that is deeply rooted in a love for Christ. The judgment has not been made for the church at Ephesus at the time of the revelation yet. No, there is still hope in the words of Christ. And that hope is found in that single word, repent. Verse 5, Jesus says, repent and do the works you did at first. Go back to the starting point and remember why you love your Savior. Live your life as a Christ-loving, humble servant, Christian. Let us take this word and live by it. Whether you have been a Christian for a few days, a Christian for a few years, or a few decades, the world has a tendency to corrode our love for our Savior. Remember that love that you first had. Rekindle it. Revel in the love of Christ. For Christ is still your King, and Christ still loves you. Oh, this is proven true by the promise that Jesus has given in the seventh verse of our passage. He who has an ear, this is the promise of the passage. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, or the one who repents of his lack of love for Christ. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Christian. 
to repent of your lack of love and to pursue wisdom of Christ because of your love for him, to live your life driven by your love for your Savior is to prove yourself to be his. This promise in verse 7 is the promise that Christ has made to all of his children in the first place. If you endure to the end, proving to be saved by his grace and loving his name, then you will eat of the tree of life and you will live for eternity in the paradise of God. In the paradise of the God that you love and in the paradise of the God who loves you. This is the promise for those of us who hold fast to Christ to the end. In summary, church, we love Christ, which should drive us to defend his truth against false teachers. We defend because we love him. The two should not be separated, but they should work together. As the study of the word of as you study the word of God, If you are intentional to do so, then you will undoubtedly fall more and more in love with him. That's God's design. You will never hear me say that the Christian should not know the word or the doctrines within, that that Christians should not know the theology of God, because to know God is to love God. We must love God, but we must study, or we must study the word, but we must study these things with the love of Christ driving us. Christian, know the word and love the Lord that gave it to us. Two pieces that work together. Now, you may be here today and you have not yet submitted to the Lordship of Christ. This love that I've been speaking of, you've never embraced it, but Maybe Christ is drawing you to himself. I want to be clear. If you don't yet know Christ as your king, the love that we are speaking of, the love that he has for his children, it is free. And I'm holding it out to you this morning. Christ can turn any dead heart to life. You have committed sins in your life, but out of his love, Christ can and will forgive you of your sins if you repent of them and submit to his rule in your life. Your sin may be great, but his grace is greater. And he promises to love those whom he saves. And when he loves them, though, when he loves those whom he saves, they in turn love him because he creates that love in you. If that love of Christ is something that you want to know more about, the pastors here at CBC, really any Christian that is here would love to tell you more about the love of Christ and how to be saved. Just ask someone at the end of this service. Brothers and sisters in Christ, know the word And remember your love for your king. Love his word and live it out for his name's sake. For his glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you out of love. Lord, you have given us a word that we may know you that we may grow in understanding and grow in love for you. And so, Lord, I pray over every one of those who call you king today that you would just ignite, reignite cold hearts back to you. But, Lord, don't we know that every day that we live here on this earth, there's a tendency, a temptation to become apathetic. Lord, may we not fall to that temptation, but may we wake up daily looking to love you more. Lord, ignite the love of your body today. Draw us nearer to you for your glory. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.